Okay, so let's go back to the complexity problem. See, I, I actually think it's, the, in some sense, it's the fundamental problem. When, when you read about the terror management theorist types, they think that death is the fundamental problem. And that's a good argument, because it's definitely a fundamental problem, but I think it's a subset of the complexity problem. And, and the reason I think that is because sometimes people's lives become so complex that they'd rather be dead. So, and the reason they seek death when, through suicide is to make the complexity go away. Because complexity causes suffering if it's uncontrolled. You know, things just get beyond your control. Um, and that can happen, you know, if you're hit by three or four catastrophes at the same time. You know, maybe you have, if, oh, the political system collapses, there's hyperinflation, you lose your job and you have someone that you love or two people die and maybe you get cancer, something like that. Like that, those things happen to people and they just think, well, there's no getting out of this. Like, it's just too much. And you know, one of the things that's very interesting about being a psychologist is that what you learn if you're going to be a psychologist is that people come to you with mental illnesses. And that's almost never true. People come to you because their lives are so damn complicated, they cannot stay on top of them in any way that doesn't make it look like they're just going to get more complicated. And so then that causes symptoms, you know, it's like, there's this old idea, it's sort of a metaphor for genetic susceptibility. Take a balloon and blow it up until it's beyond its tolerance, it's going to blow out at the weakest point. Well, that's sort of what a genetic susceptibility is. If I just keep adding complexity on top of you, at some point you'll blow out at your weakest point. You know, maybe you'll get physiologically ill, maybe you'll start drinking, maybe you'll develop an anxiety disorder, maybe you'll get OCD, maybe you'll get depressed, whatever. There'll be something about you that's the weakest point, and if I just push, that's where you'll blow out. So, that's a mental illness, but those things almost never just happen. Sometimes, but not very often. Usually people have just been hammered like two or three different ways, and then they collapse in the direction of their biological weakness, and then maybe you put them back together, but it's almost always a complexity related phenomena rather than a mental illness related phenomena not always, but almost always so, okay, so now you got this complexity problem and you think, well you deal with it conceptually and that's sort of akin to the idea that it's belief systems that protect you from death anxiety the ideas are roughly comparable, but again that's, that's wrong it's the sort of thing only a psychologist could think about, think up, because psychologists think that everything about you happens inside your head, so to speak, in your psyche, but that's not true. There's a huge chunk of you that's outside of you completely. And so, this is a really good example, like, you know, we know the oldest cities, this is a medieval city in France, a beautiful old city. Old cities were walled, and the reason for that was because they were places of wealth, and if you didn't put walls around them, then other people would come in and steal everything and kill you, so like having some walls was a good idea like the same as having walls in your house is a good idea walls between your rooms are a good idea or borders between categories are a good idea and so part of the way you simplify the world is by building walls, walls around your space because then a whole bunch of things can't come in and so you don't even have to think about them it's not conceptual, it's practical and so and, you know, one of the things I think I figured out recently is the fundamental political difference between people. And it looks to me like the fundamental political difference is how many walls should there be around your stuff? And the ultimate liberal answer is zero. And the ultimate conservative answer is, well, <laughs> bring on those walls, man. <laughs> and what's interesting about both those perspectives, first of all, is that there's temperamental contributions to them, and second, that they're both valid. So, one of the mysteries, I believe, that per permeates psychometric psychology right now is why the temperamental factors that influence pol politics are those particular temperamental factors so there's five, let's say, right, this classic big five, extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness well, the biggest predictors of political allegiance, forget about the politically correct types for a minute but on the liberal to conservative axis is that the liberals are low in conscientiousness and high in openness and the conservatives are high in conscientiousness and low in openness and so then you think, well why those two traits? that's the first question and the second question is, why those two traits together? given that they're not very highly correlated, right? they're really quite independent 
So why do they co-vary along the political axis? And I think this is the reason. I think it's exactly that, is that open people like to live on the periphery of boundaries. And they like to break boundaries between things, because interesting things happen when you, when you think a different way, when you think outside of the box, so to speak. That's what open people do. They always think outside of the box, no matter what box you put them in. You know, and sometimes you meet people that are so open that they're completely disorganized. They're, their thought process is almost completely associational, like a dreamer, they just jump from one thing to another and they're very interesting to talk to it's very hard for those people to get their lives together because they're interested in absolutely everything and their attention just flits all over the place and so they're open and that actually does go along with higher intelligence generally speaking so, and then if they're low in conscientiousness they don't see any utility in order and order, like orderly people because that's part of conscientiousness and the biggest determiner of political belief in the conscientious domain, the orderly people like to have everything in its separate place and properly structured and so, you know, their world is box inside a box, inside a shelf of boxes and then that shelf of boxes is inside another box and all those boxes are nice and neat and tight, nothing inside them is touching and everything in every box is the same thing and you know, you can see that that you can see the utility in that and that, as far as we've been able to tell, is also associated with disgust sensitivity and disgust sent, people are disgusted, generally speaking, when things that shouldn't be touching are touching like something horrible stuck to you, for example that, that's, that produces a very visceral sense of disgust and it's a boundary violation, because that's what disgust is, it's indic, in, index is a boundary violation and you can, you, how separate people should be from one another as individuals or in groups is an entirely debatable issue because there's huge advantages when people mingle and mix and there's huge dangers when people mingle and mix and so at some point you say, well the dangers are overwhelming the positives and at another point you say, well the positives are overwhelming the dangers and you have a continual argument about that with yourself but more importantly with people who have different temperament than you you know, and the, the terrible temptation is to assume that only those people who have your temperament are correct 